it's about where your runtime exists. Okay, and and this is the interesting thing about where we're getting to now because there are different also layers of that. You you you've got your browser, your code runs in the browser. That's on the the the, the user's client, right? User user side. But you've also got the edge. Um, the edge is where um, the very outer edge of the network of your provider. So um, that is the CDN exchange. So like that would be usually typically fairly close to your user, somewhere where you can actually have some compute power there. And then you've got lambdas which is in in the data center for that region right so that's that's the, the big part this is 20 minute javascript a weekly show where i your host interview members of the javascript community about all topics concerning javascript the 20 minute javascript show is brought to you by open replay an open source session replay platform meant for developers if you'd like to know more visit openreplay.com if you'd like to be on the show or suggest a topic, find us on Twitter at the 20 minutejs Welcome to episode number 29. I'm Fernando, your host. And today I'm going to be interviewing Ben Reed. He's a developer and DevRel at Webinee. And he's here to tell us a little bit about his own experience with serverless JavaScript, how to get started, and why would we want to get into it. So welcome to the show, Ben. Please introduce yourself to our audience. Okay, so yeah, my name's Ben. I usually go by Benjamin just because there's another developer in London called Benjamin Reed, and I don't want to get confused. But Ben's <laughs> fine. Fair. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've I've been developing the web for um, over ten years now. Love it. Like you know, it, it wasn't the first career I had, but it's certainly been the most interesting and rewarding. Um, and um, so I started off just building small sites for myself. Got a job. Got my own agency for a little while. Um, but then um, worked um, for um, larger organizations um, as a JavaScript engineer, and now work at Webony. So Webony is a is a serverless headless CMS. So um, it's a quite an interesting project. But that that that, that covers quite a few buzzwords. So I'll break it down a little bit. So um, open source, of course, it's it's on GitHub. The code is freely available. You can download it and run it yourself. Um, headless CMS, so content management system, so you can put all of your, your blogs and your and, and, and structured content in there, create your models, and, and start writing. So it's a writing interface, um, and um, and yeah, we we focused on even though it's open source, we do have a it's like a sort of enterprise angle, so like larger organizations to to start using it, and um, and and so yeah, so that's that's basically what I do is on the DevRel team there as well as a JavaScript engineer. Awesome. All right. And it sounds like you're also dealing with serverless and dealing with the cloud. So we're, we're probably going to be touching several points there. But the topic that brought you here is serverless functions and serverless JavaScript, essentially. So let's go with the basics. I always have the same question. What is it? So what does serverless functions mean in the context of JavaScript? Let's start there. Yeah, okay. So as as um, JavaScript engineers, developers, we write code that runs in the browser, typically. That's what we do, right? And except if it's built statically. So new trend was because of SEO um, and uh, performance reasons, people started building their applications before. So they'd build it on a node server. It would compile to JavaScript and HTML, and we'd have that running in the browser, right? Um, but now we've got to the stage where We've also got isomorphic applications, applications where JavaScript runs both in the browser and on the server. And um, that distinction can be a little bit muddy sometimes, right? You don't know where, where is your code going to run? Is it going to run on the server? Is it going to run on the client? Um, so a good example of this is Next.js is get a server side prop. So if you've got a if you've got a containerized application, you're obviously that part of it will run on the on the container, on the server, and the rest of it will run on the client. Um, it's a so that's a backend service. So that that backend is running constantly, all the time, in in a container somewhere, in a VM, in a Kubernetes pod, right? Um, so so if it's but but that's not always the case. See, like if you've got a um, an XJ apps application running in tr traditional architecture, that's how it works. But if you're running it in Netlify or Vercel or some other provider like that, I don't know if any other people do this, but next. Um, Vercel and Netlify definitely do. They 
you get server side props, it's actually a, a standalone alone function, right? It's not a whole container running. It's just the serverless function. So in fact, if you're using an XJS application in Vercel and Netlify, you are actually using serverless functions already. Ta-da! Um, so, it, <laughs> and, and also uh, Gatsby 4 has a similar sort of thing um, with their get server data. That, that's also a, a server side, side um, standalone function running in Gatsby Cloud. So, all right. There's different, uh, the, the, yeah. So that's basically that's basically it. Okay. So that's an interesting point. So those are functions that we could be using directly in our server, or if we're using like a, uh, one of the providers, like you mentioned. Yes. <clears throat> they have yeah. their own like implementation of it, and they run it somewhere else. But right. so the term serverless, I mean, it <laughs> needs to run somewhere. I'm assuming. So um, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? Sure. Definitely. So. There are servers, right? Serverless isn't serverless. No, let's, um, let's not get caught up in that terminology. <laughs> it's a bad name yeah. for it. Um, but so is headless for headless CMS because it's not. You, you are getting the head, not the headless bit. So it, the terminology is hard. React isn't reactive. All right? So there's lots of other different situations where names don't really work. But but right. what, what serverless means is you don't have to manage the server. All right? So you, you still got servers. You're still, still running somewhere, obviously. But you don't have to worry about it okay you don't need to worry you don't oh, what's my container doing what version of ubuntu is it what other dependencies have i got um and and you just concentrate on your code what you're writing what you need to deliver so business deliverables directly and, and not all the other um fluff you would have to worry about if you're in a containerized environment kubernetes and okay kind of i like that all right so to me as a developer in it's yeah. like it's serverless because I don't have to worry about it. But in reality, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like the difference between buying one candy for your kid and buying the whole sweet store. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a good analogy. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what are the pros and cons of going with serverless functions? I mean, why would we and why wouldn't we? Yeah. So I guess the pros are there's less worry, as I kind of already touched on. Like, there's... There's just a single responsibility. You just worry about what you need to write and deliver. Okay, that's that's it. So um, and also you you don't have to, so you don't have to worry about the whole back end. For example, like I had a situation with one one employer I worked at where suddenly um, a bunch of sixteen was no longer supported in their in their VMs. So we have to rewrite rewrite every container that we had deployed, reboot it. We have to update all the dependencies. Um, upgrade all the Docker containers, upgrade Node, upgrade the broken dependencies from that because they no longer worked, cycle the pods, you know, hopefully the hypervisor would direct traffic to the new ones. It, it was a lot of work. Um, with serverless, it wouldn't happen, right? We've got still, you can still use Node 12. Um, that's that's end of life in on AWS in November this year. And once you deploy it, it's live. So, you know, you, you don't have to worry about nearly as much as you do if you've got got containers and you don't pay for what you don't use like it's not it's not always running um these these uh serverless functions just they just spin up they run and then they they, they die again so you don't you don't have to pay for them unless you you're actually using them so you could end up paying more if you're using lots and lots and lots of events but um but for most people it doesn't happen right you can you can also you know, pay nothing right but there's a uh, I want to say cost, but it's not monetary cost, but a performance cost to having that kind of environment, right? I mean, the exactly. function is not always running, it's not always accessible, so it needs to uh, like warm up or what's the term? Mm -hmm. Like like hot functions are always that active and responsive, and others have to like boot up or what's what's the deal there? Yes, exactly. So yeah, that's exactly it. You've you've got cloud functions that you know you can just call them. They spin up if you if you have like um, uh, suddenly a, a massive amount of traffic uh, to your network, you you get like enough serverless functions to be able to manage that traffic. So you don't have to worry about things like DDoS attacks and stuff like that because your your platform will scale um, to, to to meet those demands. So that's pretty good. And it's it, yeah, you know, there was a problem at the start with with cold starts with with AWS Lambda, but it's it's pretty much been mitigated now. It's not really a problem anymore. So you, you know, you can just call the function; it'll work. And um, yeah, it's it's available for you when you need it. And and then, I mean, there has to be something wrong with them. At least a, a reason why you wouldn't do it. There has to be some kind of con 
to using serverless. Yeah, or isn't there? It, 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 okay, so it does require a different way of thinking. It's it's very much event driven platform. So you have to think about the request response and what you want to do with that. Um, the other thing that's a bit more of a challenge is developing locally because, of course, if if you've got to like uh, you've got one lambda that you're working on, one serverless function you're working on, then that's fine. That's that's easy to duplicate to run locally. Like with Netlify Dev, quite often you're fine running uh, serverless functions locally. But when you've got 30, 40 <laughs> massive application like Webinar is, then of course, you, you, either you've got to do some really tricky stuff with lots of containers running, or you've just got to say, Look, hey, this is this is not the way to go. Um, let's use the cloud as it is, use the serverless um, system as it is meant, as it designs to. So what, what we decided to do with Webinar is you, you, you spin up locally only the section of the application that you're working on, and then you have your dev environment the majority of it is in the cloud, so you can develop locally, but only the the certain the concerns that you're you're focused on. Um, That's an interesting hybrid setup. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Yeah. All right. So, do we have to do anything different to write serverless functions? Are there are they like normal functions, or are there restrictions or limitations around serverless functions that we need to think about? No, I don't think so. Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty much it's just JavaScript, right? You can import things, you can have uh, dependencies. I think there's there's like a size limit for lambdas, right? You can't um, like there's the reason that AWS came up with this whole layering thing, so you can have like a lambda package which actually has different layers to it, so you can have different lambdas running with different things. Is because sometimes like if you're running a something really large, like I think my friend was running Puppeteer, and he had to run Puppeteer in one lambda and um, interface with it in another lambda using a layer um but that's that's kind of a yeah that's an edge use case you can you can run an, an express server fine in a lambda that's, that's, that's no problem at all yeah all right all right and and so you've been talking about lambdas aws lambdas what other type of serverless are out there because you have on one side aws mm -hmm. but every cloud provider has one and then you have yeah. like Vercel, like Netify, you don't have Dino Deploy that also yeah. provides something yeah. like it. So what kind of a spectrum do we have to deal with and what are the main differences or, or the main reasons why you will go with one or the other? Mm. So I'd just like to clarify that there's been a, what I've noticed lately is there's been a little bit of confusion around the term serverless and cloud computing. Right. Cloud computing is different, right? Cloud computing okay. is what always on the traditional sort of architecture, just you are leveraging the power of, of cloud. So um, things like EC2 instances or Elastic Kubernetes service from AWS, these kind of things, they they are um, always on. You know, you pay for hourly um, increments of that. Um, right. I'm not talking about that here, although that you can use those with serverless as well. Like, but what I'm talking about is, is where you're, is, is the event driven architecture, right? You pay for, um, not hourly, but but based on uses usage, All right? Predominantly, like so so, it's about where your runtime exists, okay? And and this is the interesting thing about where we're getting to now because there are different also layers of that. You you you've got your browser, your code runs in the browser. That's on the the the, the user's client, right? User user side. But you've also got the edge. Um, the edge is where um, the very outer edge of the network of your provider. So um, that is the CDN exchange. So like that would be usually typically fairly close to your user, somewhere where you can actually have some compute power there. And then you've got lambdas, which is in in the data center for that region, right? So that's that's the, the big pot of, of uh, computing power that you've got access to. Now I think you mentioned Dino Deploy, and I did have a look at this before we started recording because I thought that was quite interesting. It doesn't really say what it is, but it's a, like a managed hosting service. So um, it's like Heroku, but for for Dino. I, th I think right. I think that looking at the documentation, <laughs> that seems to be the angle it's going for. I haven't tried Dino yet. I really want to get my my, my claws into that one, but I haven't had the chance yet. Um, so it looks like it's serverless because it is event driven architecture, right? So 
as I, I started with, like serverless is still not clearly defined. You can't actually run, you know, define your container for your Lambda. All right. So, but let's just go with it. Like serverless is just a, a different paradigm. <laughs> there's there's always going to be crossover because it's not it's not clearly defined yet. We're still sort of like at the fairly at the beginning of this. I do think it's the future. But of course, with everything, right. it, it takes it takes a while to to get defined and, and figure out what it is and how we can use it. Okay, and something else that you mentioned then you talked about next and deploying next to like mm. Bercel or or Netlify. You, there's also like Remix and other similar frameworks that fall into this serverless yeah. ecosystem or mm. that essentially you get to, you have a way to deploy them into these providers that turn them into serverless somehow. Mm. Um, yes. I don't know what kind of black magic they're using, but it ends up being you deploy your code and you don't care about the servers, you don't care about the infrastructure, it's just there and works and it scales and everything. Is this also like some kind of serverless deployment or are we talking about something else here? Yes and no. <laughs> so um, All right. okay, think about it, like, okay, so um, people like Netlify and Vercel and other, other providers like that, Heroku is another good example and um, other services like that. They, they leverage the power of these cloud providers Right. They leverage the power of AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, and others, and their platforms are built on top of those providers. So I think of it like tier one and tier two. So tier one is like your Google Cloud, AWS, and that kind of thing. Tier two is Heroku, Netlify, Vercel, et cetera. And they provide, they they wrap some of those services for you, and then they have a certain fees, obviously, and charges to, to monetize that, what they've built. Yeah. Now, right. The interesting thing about Net, uh, Next.js is that it's only serverless when it's got one of those specialist architectures like Netlify and Vercel. If you try to run it serverlessly on your own, you are going to have a headache. You, you can't use get server side props in a way unless you, um, what's the word, reverse engineer it. And that, that takes a lot of time and effort. Right? Remix is slightly different from looking at the docs. I haven't used it heavily, but their technical explanation is actually the cleanest I've seen really it's it has a clear yeah. delineation between what renders on the client what renders on the server and how that you can how you can host those separately so um I, th I think it's a different different case all right cool essentially from what you're saying i'm getting that serverless functions are great the infrastructures or the service providers that give you the ability to create and run serverless functions have overcome all the major hurdles that they had at the yeah. beginning, like this boot up time and so on, uh, even the uh, size and time limitation. So uh, what are some of the classic use cases for serverless functions or should we like go completely serverless and forget about the usual and traditional way of developing and deploying applications? I think you could go completely serverless, you know, I mean, it does require a slightly different way of thinking, like I said, event driven. But I think you can do anything. For example, look, just look at what we built with, with Webony. It's, it's not one application, it, it's four, right? You've got a headless CMS, you've got a file manager, a no-code page builder, and a form builder. And all of them run on serverless functions connecting to DynamoDB and, and storage with S3. Um, so one of the things we do use always on infrastructure with is, is Elasticsearch. So, um, there is one option in Webony, whereas if you've got going to have a lot of records, like a lot of different content types, a lot of different content, then that it gets very hard to search that. Um, so the large searches, we use, we do use Elastic, Amazon's Elastic Search service because there's no other way of efficient way of indexing and searching documents like that. Um, but, you know, like I said, Webony is, you know, built on, on the whole thing is, is, is driven by serverless. So. You know, it's it's. I think the floor is open. It'd be really interesting to see what what comes of out of that in the next couple of years to see what people do with it. You know, right. It's definitely a change in your internal mindset, in your mind architecture, if you will, because you have to think about individual functions and have them anywhere, and don't worry about that. Instead of you know having them inside your project and inside specific files in specific folder structure it differently 
but but yeah, I can see how if you go full serverless, full distributed, then you really can scale to whatever limits you need to without having to worry about if you had the right architecture. Or not. I mean, it's not like a silver bullet, but it's definitely one big step towards having something scalable. Yeah, yeah. All right. And you kind of hinted at it at saying that this is more of an event-driven architecture, essentially, when you go serverless. But let's think about someone who's listening and has never done serverless before. But they want to start using it. So what are the concepts, uh, the, you know, the core concepts that they will have to read up on before diving right, you know, head first into a serverless deployment? Um, I, I think... Like, as, as I said before, like a lot of people will already be using these without really realizing it. So you've got a Next.js application or similar. So yeah. I think start start with that. Start with Netlify, uh, Vercel or, or one of those providers. Um, and then, you know, they have, they've obviously got f functions as a service that they provide. And you can start messing around, tinkering with what you can do, like fetching data and sending it back or, you know, building a small API and those kind of things. Um, I think that... Um, those tools, Netlify and Vercel, et cetera, have made it much easier to deploy. That, that's one of the challenges is deployment. So it, they obviously you can just send it to their infrastructure and they'll sort it out for you. So that makes it a lot easier um, to, to get started by using one of those um, second tier services. Then you could either pick up a tutorial from um, one of the serverless framework providers. Uh, we'll talk about those in a few minutes, I think. Or um, or pick up an existing application that's been written and that has like tutorials or um, documentation about how to deploy it, like like Webinary, shameless plug again, and tinker with it. You can, you know, it's <laughs> it's plug inable architecture. You know, we built it, it should be completely customizable. So you can you just see what you can create with that. All right. And uh, when it comes to providers to this, I mean, you kind of already hinted at it, saying, you know, talking about Bercel, talking about Netlify, even AWS. Do you have any other? like recommended provider or are these like the three major ones that you usually use? Yeah, I, I do. Like, so I've used Azure a bit. Um, AWS is of course the, the, the big daddy here. They're, they're the ones that's, that, that started it all. Um, so Azure has has had a history of being a little bit unstable. That They're really working on it. And I know, know it'll get there. It's like the second favorite among serverless developers is Azure. Google Cloud shortly behind that. Um, it is getting there. Um, Amazon, AWS has a reputation for dropping unexpected bills on people. And so you can, that, you know, it's it's mitigating that problem quite a lot. Like now there's a whole billing sort of section where you can set alerts. And, you know, if you're reaching 20% of, they, have a gen, they do have a generous free tier, right? You do get a lot for free. Yeah. But now you can set alerts and say, look, if you've had 50% of your free usage and you're, you're or eighty percent, and it'll it'll email you. It'll tell you that that it's approaching that, and you can you can then do something about it. But to be honest with you, I've been using serverless for two years. I've got like different instances of Webinary floating around. I've I've only paid like it's been less than three dollars in two years that I've ever paid Amazon for for what I've used. Like okay, I, I don't get a lot of high high traffic stuff, I, you know. But but right, on the right, other hand, right. you know it it hasn't it's hardly cost me anyway. And that's and that's the other beauty of it. You you do have like these proof of concepts are pretty much free <laughs> like if you're getting small traffic to it right experimentation you know you just go wild because you can you can do a lot of stuff on the free tier without having to worry about it um and then if it's in production and you are using a lot obviously you pay for usage but then that's great right because you've get, you're getting a lot of traffic from it you're getting a lot of business you know it's only fair that you should you should pay for that absolutely so talking about the frameworks now the from the looks of it the big one is called serverless framework yeah, but and there are there are others less known as well. So if you want to get started with this, and if you want to start creating serverless functions using JavaScript that are not automatically created, like you know deploying your Next.js project into into Brazil or something, then which one is the framework that you will recommend? Where would you send people to start reading and tr tinkering with? Well, this is a difficult one. So I started with um, the serverless framework myself. So I started building like little tinkering little things like that. So the, the infrastructure there is written as YAML files. 
Um, so that obviously you've got to be okay with, with the animal and, and that kind of stuff. But but it is good, you know, they've got lots of tutorials, lots of starter kits where it'll just, it'll give you a React application with a serverless function and you can just um, deploy it from from their CLI tools. But yeah, as you, as you said, there's, right, there's a lot of different providers like AWS has got four of its own um, Amplify, which right. is mostly for customer facing front end apps, like to do the authentication and those kind of things, those kind of uh, components. There's Cloud CloudFormation, which is infrastructure as code. Um, um, and then there's uh, SAM, which is a cloud formation abstraction kit. And then the CDT, CDK, which is a cloud development kit. So that's obviously a bit more high level. So there's there's also the serverless stack. There's a serverless framework, as I mentioned, and Plumi, which is infrastructure as code, code in JavaScript, which I, I think is great because then you can, I can write TypeScript, JavaScript code, and, and that can be my ar architecture, um, my infrastructure setup. Right. So so that's quite good. But yeah, there's, there's quite a range of tools and they do cover different things. Um, yeah, you know, there's, there's loads. It's still a still maturing market on that front. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, you know, people have then to do some research and, and figure out which one's the one that s serves their purposes yeah. most then. All right. Cool. That's That was the last question I had about uh, serverless and serverless JavaScript. So now we move on to the quick round. So I, I hope you prepare for it because some people think that these are easy yeah. and then no. they get surprised. <laughs> yes, I did. I did have a little there. So um, yeah, I'll see how I go. <laughs> All right. We'll see how you yeah. do then. <clears throat> All right. So the first question is, what is the best advice you ever received? Oh, this is this is a tough one. I'm going to go with people, not things. Right. It's 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 about people. You know, people make up your company, you make up your your team, your friends. It, it, it's better to to like in in my opinion, you don't you don't spend as much as your life with with things, you know, they come and go, people stick around, you know, it's, it's those you want to, kind of relationships you want to cultivate. Yeah. That's great. That's great advice. <laughs> Absolutely. Next one. What is the most exciting project you worked on? I must say at this point, Remedy, <laughs> it, it's not, I'm not just saying that, like, um, I, I, I basically, I was, I was a community member for, for, since it became open source and they started a community. I was one of the first members because I could see the potential that it's got. I, I just think, um, so I, I came and I, I approached the team and I said, hey, look, I'd love to come and, and shout about you a bit more because I think it's really great what you're doing. And um, I think there's so much potential here. Um, so I am, I'm a fan. Um, and um, and I do think that, uh, yeah, it's got a great a great future ahead. Um, and it's just, it's a, it is a great team that are working on it. Some really, really clever, clever people. So, you know, I'm definitely not the smartest person in the room there. So it's really great, great to benefit from their experience and knowledge. Yeah, that's cool. Then last question, what is one thing you wish you knew when you started your career that you eventually picked up mm, over the years? Yeah. Uh, so it's that nobody really knows what they're doing, <laughs> right? <laughs> we've all got a certain amount of knowledge and experience, right? But that's only built up because we've just hit the wall and thought, I've got no clue, right? And, that, and that's kind yeah. of reassuring when you think about it, because, you know, the junior developers and younger developers didn't worry like there's 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 no no set pattern it's only just figuring it out for yourself and that's the only way to learn to code and and therefore everybody's only got a, an incremental amount of more experience than you have so so you you have to just push through that and uh get it wrong a load of times before you get it right it's the only way to do it <laughs> absolutely absolutely agree with that all right <clears throat> Thank you so much. Finally, please, can you tell our audience where they can find you if they want to know more about either Webany or serverless sure. in general? Yeah, yeah. Um, happy for people to get connected. So on Twitter, I'm muzzlehatch underscore. So M-U-Z-Z-L-E-H-A-T-C-H with an underscore at the end. Bit of a random one. There is a story behind it. Everywhere else, I'm usually... <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, I'm usually Endymion1818, so E-N-D-Y-M-I-O-N-1818. And there is a story behind that as well. <laughs> so that's that's usually my handle on uh, on things like Reddit and that. And uh, my website is uh, deliciousreverie.co.uk, and that's not a cooking reference. That's a literature reference. Right. So um, deliciousreverie.co.uk, you can find me there. We'll add the links in the show notes anyway. But that's it. Thank right. you, Ben. Uh, again, for coming in, discussing serverless. 
and hope people find it useful. Yeah, no, it's been great. Thanks, thanks for talking. Yeah, thank you, and everyone else listening. Thank you for listening, and catch you on the next one. Right. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. And if you haven't yet, take 10 seconds and leave a review of the show on your podcasting app. It will help us grow and reach more developers. And while you're at it, follow us on Twitter at The20MinuteJS. This episode was brought to you by Open Replay, an open source session replay platform for developers. Visit openreplay.com to know more. And I'll see you back here next week.